The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to the twelve apostles, The disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the, to the earth. I have come to bring, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be seated, please. When I was a uh, child and in primary school, I, one of the things, that, the features that I remember about our school, which is a very old-fashioned sort of building, every classroom had a picture of George Washington. It's always the same picture. It looks like he was sort of uh, rising up out of, a, out of a lot of cotton fluff or something. But it was the same picture, I think, probably in every classroom, probably all around the country. But it was there because George Washington was, of course, one of our heroes. He was the, you know, the father of the country. He fought battles and suffered greatly to overthrow the colonial regime. He was the first president and apparently an honest man, even though we discovered that the cherry tree story was just a story. But he was apparently an honest man and, and a, a credible first president, a kind of hero for all of us. But then somewhere along the line, we discovered that he also enslaved people. And that's never a good look, at least as far as we were concerned as kids. And it was a chink in the armor. But the truth of the matter is, every one of our heroes will have some chinks in the armor. Every one of our heroes will have some flaws. Now, some people find that really distressing. I understand that in lots of uh, board of education meetings and some state assemblies, there's all sorts of furor about people saying we shouldn't be teaching those kinds of negative things to our children. They seem to believe that we should only think, think the good things and ignore the fact that these heroes were just ordinary people, just like you, just like me. 
and because they were ordinary people, they were flawed people. Now, that never, it never threw me as a child to understand that, and I don't think it, it flew uh, through too many of my friends either. I mean, we all seem to just accept that a lot of us were growing up in church, and one of the things we knew from church is that, well, everybody's got flaws. Everybody is prone to be sinful. Everybody is prone to make mistakes. Every human being since Adam and Eve, that's just a given. The only one who came amongst us and who is sinless was Jesus himself. And I believe that, that Jesus was the one who lived in a perfect relationship with the Father. The kind of relationship that, in a sense, is, is meant for humans, but not something that we don't always seem to be capable of. And yet even Jesus, let me tell you something. My mother, my mother was a devout woman, a very devout woman. Her name was Martha. And whenever she'd hear that story of Jesus visiting the sisters, Mary and Martha, and Martha complained to Jesus that her sister was just sitting there while she was getting, doing all the preparation and work, and Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you're troubled by many things. Mary has chosen the better part. There's only one thing that's needed. My mother would say under her breath, well, he would have really been disappointed if he didn't get anything to eat. <laughs> so you see, even Jesus, while he may be sinless, is still subject to criticism. <laughs> because that's just part of human life. Now the reason I went into that little diatribe is to say to you that we hear a story in today's first reading. A story of people who are in many ways the heroes of our faith. Abraham, father of, of all faithful people, the patriarch, the great, the, the one who, who uh, followed God into, he didn't know where, but God called him from where he was to say, come and follow, come to, I will promise to give, you know, you, you'll be provided with land and with a family. And he takes up with his wife Sarah and the rest of the, of the family and, 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 you know, group of people that were around him, and they emigrate to, um, the land of Canaan, the promised land, is not given to him, but it's there. God promises that it will be. He's told he'll be the father of many nations, but he and Sarah are seemingly incapable of producing an heir. They seem unable to conceive a child. And yet he believed, and he followed. And we say, ooh, this is wonderful. The, the father and mother of all faithful people, the two of them together. And this is, isn't this a wonder, aren't they our heroes? And then we hear today's story. Now, first of all, the backstory of this was that in desperation at one point, Sarah said to Abraham, looked at her slave woman and said, go have a child with her. The first probably recorded biblical incident of surrogate motherhood. That in itself is, raises a lot of questions, let's just say. But there it is. That's what she did. That's what he did. And they produced the child Ishmael. But then God promised, you see. God came and said, Sarah will conceive. And she did. And then we hear the story as it picks up today of Isaac at his weaning, uh, when they're having a sort of celebration to celebrate the fact that the baby, the child, is now weaned. And Sarah notices he's playing with that stepchild, that stepbrother, rather, the, the half-brother. She goes to her husband, she can't deal with that. She goes to her husband, she says, get that woman out of here. She and her child, I don't want them with my child. This is not a good look for one who's one of the heroes of the faith, the mother of all faithful people. And Abraham, okay, God talks to him. God says, she'll be all right. He caves and gives in and sends her off, sends off the slave woman with her child into the desert with a skin of water and a bit of bread. This is not what I would call one of those Bible stories where you want to end with the, first, with, with, with the line, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> <laughs> this is not something to emulate, but it's the story of Abraham and Sarah. And I think it's there for a reason. There are probably all sorts of theological, you know, uh, thought, uh, thoughts you could have about the story and, and, and you know, and, and get certain things from it. 
but what i want to focus on is not really, in a sense, abraham and sarah and what i consider to be what we would, i think, from our modern perspective at least, consider to be a kind of flawed thing to do to send a woman and a child off into the desert you know with with just the skin of water and a loaf of bread seems a bit harsh um and and it is, i think but i just want to focus for the moment on the slave woman herself in her desperation because i think this is this is something to for this morning at least this is something to focus on in her desperation as she arrives at beersheba and she looks and realizes you know the water's run out the bread is probably gone at this point what is she going to do in desperation in, in total despair because it would have to be despair the mother takes the child puts him under a bush and says i can walk to, to a, away a little bit and says i, I just can't can't watch him die and i think if you know you can understand human um, um, the sense of human despair, the depths of despair, this would be it. And in the midst of her despair is when God shows her the well at Beersheba. And she knows she's going to survive. She knows that God is going to let her and her child survive. And that's, I think, the point that I want to bring out in this particular story because she overcame her despair she overcame her fear she overcame because god was with her and she understood that in a profound way that touched her she was able to get up and move on and yes ishmael became as god had said he became you know with the founder of a of a people himself in the gospel story for today, we have St. Matthew give us a whole collection of, of Jesus' sayings. Um, it's, it's sort of like, I think, to my mind, they're all sort of lumped together. It doesn't seem to follow in a definite sort of storyline pattern. But it's the gospel, after all, which is simply to present the good news of Jesus to us. It's not a, a biography of Jesus or something like that. It's a story. It's to present the good news. And in this case, a whole collection of sayings of Jesus. And they all deal with the subject of fear and despair, one way or another. He's telling them, why should you expect to be speaking to disciples, his disciples, but speaking also to us, his disciples? You know, why should you expect, if the master himself was criticized, if the master himself was called, uh, you know, accused of being from the devil, why should you expect different? Why should you expect different from the master? Why should you expect to be treated wonderfully? Why should you expect to be put on a pedestal and raised up in a way that, that the master himself wasn't? And then he says in, in several times, in several places, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of what people say. Don't be afraid of speaking the truth. Don't be afraid, more particularly, of living the truth. Don't be afraid. Because fear is what, what, what sort of um, 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 destroys human life fear is really someone once said fear is fear is the opposite of love not interesting interesting that for that thought you know it's not hate is the opposite but fear because in a sense fear itself drives what we would call hate we're afraid of things that are different or we're afraid of being different we're afraid of speaking what and why are we afraid well because it might upset somebody in the family i mean we all you know we joke about the, everybody having a crazy uncle come at thanksgiving and you got to keep your you know, don't say too much, especially about politics, because you'll be off on a rant and you don't want to hear it. Um, we, you know, yes, but, but there are times when we must speak the truth, not just to be annoying to crazy uncles or other relatives, but we must speak the truth. And it might not make us popular, well-liked, or, um, or, or prosperous. But this is who we're called to be as the people of God, to recognize that the fears that we have are fears that God deals with. If we want to be in, you know, we need to trust in his presence. The whole point of the gospel is that God shows us in Jesus that he's always with us, that we're surrounded by his love. And we need to feel what the slave woman Hagar felt when she suddenly recognized that, you know, it's going to be all right. We're going to get through whatever we're going to get through. That God is with us. Now, fear, you know, fear runs in all time. I mean, you have the fear that you would feel if you were in the middle of a battle or a war, whether you're as a, a, as a military person or as a, 
as a, as a civilian, I mean, there's real fears about, you gotta think about what you're doing. But even there, if you stop doing, if you just suddenly froze in place, you would put yourself in even greater danger. That's sort of an extreme case for most of us are the things that we fear aren't that. We, we aren't, aren't quite that life and death serious, but we do fear sometimes about well, being the odd person out, or taking a different point of view, or not being liked by other people, or, or all sorts of things that we worry about. And what Jesus says is, why are you worrying about anything at all? Look at the sparrows. They're just birds, but God looks after them. Aren't you worth more than them? Look at the, the hairs on your head. You know, They're all numbered. God knows who you are. God knows what you need. God is there. Jesus came to reassure us that in all of life we're surrounded by the love of God and he will bring us through and even in the midst in the depths of our despairs you know, God is there if we just open our hearts and minds to his presence and what our call is as disciples of Jesus is to share that knowledge with other people Sometimes it's not going to make us popular. Sometimes it's not going to make us seem, um, you know, with it or attractive even to some other stuff. But we've got to speak, and more particularly, we've got to act as people who genuinely believe that the love of God is poured out on the whole of the human race and that he's there, ready, willing, and able to embrace and uplift to hold us all up, that everyone is within reach of his saving embrace. If that offends some people, if that causes a dissension in the family, if that bothers, you know, uh, or, or puts us on the, on the outs, so be it. But in God's good time, all those things will be brought to light. God's truth, God's love, God's caring for all of us. Pray God that in the living of our lives, we live into that. The freedom and joy and wonder of knowing God is with us, and that nothing can separate us from his love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.